All right, if you'll open up to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 24 today. This is going to round out the book of Ephesians. And by the way, if you've got any ideas, comments, suggestions for next week, I'm not hard to find. Let me know if you got anything. Because I don't have anything. You know, a lot of times I come in like, oh man, after we get done with, with Mark, we're going to do Ruth. And then after Ruth, we're going to do this. You know, I, I, I got nothing for you. So if you got a suggestion, I'm, I'm all ears this time. So anyway, a person who calls himself Frank and not necessarily a proper first name. A person who calls himself frank and candid can very easily find himself becoming tactless and cruel. A person who prides himself on being tactful can eventually find that he can become evasive and deceitful. A person with firm convictions can become pig-headed. A person who is inclined to be temperate and judicious can sometimes turn into someone with weak convictions and banked fires of resolution. Loyalty can lead to fanaticism. Caution can become timidity. Freedom can become license. Confidence can become arrogance. And humility can become servility. All of these are ways that strengths can become weaknesses. How much effort and weight do you put into the things that you do? As we reflect back upon the book of Ephesians... Paul's given us a lot of doctrine in those first three chapters. And the doctrine was excellent and very good, and we learned a lot in those three chapters. And since then, we've been, we've been given tips and tricks and motivations to follow through with putting that doctrine into practice. We've learned about submission. We've learned about love. We've talked about walking in light and in unity. We've seen grace and mercy on display. And as we all look at these things, we might be led to believe that I can do that. That looks easy. I could probably do that. Sure, no problem. It can't be that hard. And what we perceive as a strength might actually be our biggest downfall. The second that you think that you've got all of this stuff figured out, is the second that I'm going to be able to tell you that you don't have a clue. The title of the message is this. You don't stand a chance. You don't stand a chance. If you think in your own might, in your own strength, and somehow in your own way, you're going to take these chapters of duty that Paul has given us that have been born out of the doctrine, if you somehow think that in your own strength and in your own way and with your own might, that you're going to be able to pull this thing off with other people as you seek to serve other people, let me be the very first person to tell you, you don't stand a chance. You don't. Any strength that you think that you might have in the midst of trying to figure this stuff out will quickly become your downfall. You don't stand a chance. We need help outside of ourselves to do this stuff with skill. And without God's help, we definitely don't stand a chance. Wouldn't it be nice if Paul would conclude this book with some details as to how we'd accomplish all that we've been asked to do? What is the, the help or the strength that we can find so that we can do this effectively? And by this, I mean serve one another in submission. Love each other as we're supposed to. Love each other like Christ loves us? How are we supposed to walk in the light? How are we supposed to put off and put on? How are we supposed to walk in unity? What kind of tips and tricks can he give us now? What kind of advice can he give us now? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 24 because that's exactly what he's going to do to end this book. God wants you to find your strength in him. 
Because oftentimes we look for strength in so many other places. We want to find it in our spouse. We want to find it in our workplace. We want to find something somewhere else. We want to go to the bookstore and find a self-help book in this area. Or we want to just find a tape that we can listen to to give us strength in that. Or we want to do something. We want to do anything other than go to God for help. But let me tell you guys something. Without him, you don't stand a chance. I don't care what book you're reading or what tape you're listening to or what show you're watching or who your therapist is. Without him, you don't stand a chance. God wants you to find your strength in him. There's three ways to find your strength in the Lord. First way, verses 10 through 13, we find our strength in him by knowing our enemy. You need to know your enemy. Somebody really wise, Chinese guy used to say that. Know thy enemy. Confucius. You do have an enemy that stalks you, that does hunt you down, who wants to watch you fail, who celebrates your failures much more than even you do. Know your enemy. Second way we find our strength in the Lord, verses 14 through 17, we find our strength in him by knowing our equipment. Yes, this is the armor of God passage. You need to know what equipment you've been given by the Lord through him that you can use to find your strength in him. And finally, the third way that we find our strength in the Lord, we find our strength in him, verses 18 through 20, by knowing our effort. And whose effort is it really that you're depending upon to achieve anything in this life? And you may be thinking to yourself, I thought you said through verse 24. I did. Verses 21 through 24 is kind of like a, an epilogue, kind of a, a signing off, if you will. You know, sometimes those old radio hosts and stuff will say, yeah, and this is so-and-so signing off. That's him signing off. So let's start to look at this. God wants you to find your strength in him by knowing our enemy. Let's read verses 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Know your enemy. He's going to start off this in verse 10 by saying, finally, my brethren. It's one of those, remember when we were doing James and he used to always say my brethren. Remember why he would do that? This is all the way back into James. I know you're going to have to like really think about this, right? He's putting his arm around you. You ever have somebody, some a good friend of yours just come alongside of you, just sit real close to you. They put their arm around you and they go, my friend, we just need to chat for just a second. Buddy, pal, chum. He says, finally, my brother. And he just puts his arm around you. He just, he just dropped all kinds of knowledge on you, whether it was doctrine or duty. And you're probably spinning your head like, you want me to do what? Oftentimes when we talk about this submission stuff, a lot of people start to really keel back and they go, what? You want me to do what? Finally, my brethren, just, just listen to me for just a second. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Where do you find your strength? He doesn't say, my brethren, be strong in the books of the bookstore. Because there's all kinds of wisdom there. You can learn anything you want to learn. That's not what he says, is it? Finally, my brethren, be strong at your workplace. Take charge. And... That's not what he says. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, by the way, hopefully this is giving you some kind of a flashback to chapter 3. Do you remember how strong he is and what he's able to do for us, to us, through us? Remember that in chapter 3? Bonus points if you go back there and look. 
the end of chapter 3. He'll tell you just how strong and how powerful the Lord is. And now he's trying to recall your memory to that, to tell you to be strong in him and in the power of his might, which you should know by now is incredible. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, I like that he says the whole armor of God. He could have just said, put on the armor of God. And he would have been okay and justified in saying, put on the armor of God. But what does he say? He puts a qualifier on this. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Not just one piece, not just the piece that you like, not just the piece that's the easiest, not just the piece that makes the most sense to you right now. No, put on the whole armor of God, every part of it. So that, here's why, you may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks of the devil. Know your enemy. You are required. You need to. And you don't stand a chance if you don't. The only way that you're going to be able to stand up in this life, the only way this is going to happen is if you stand strong in him, having put on the whole armor of God. Because there's somebody out there that just cannot wait to wreak havoc on your life and he gets his kicks off of doing it. And you are not exempt by any means from him. He's just waiting to see you mess up. He's waiting to see you screw up. He's waiting until you have some sort of bad thought so you can latch onto that thing. He's waiting for you to do something dumb so he can remind you of it for the next hundred years. Yeah, he's out there. He's the one doing it. And he really enjoys it for some reason. You ever work with somebody and it just seems like they just thrive on chaos and, and, and confusion and they just love just making your life miserable and you hate just going to work every day because this person's there and you're just like, man, what is wrong with this guy? You think that person's bad. Satan is way worse than that. Know your enemy. Get a clue. He's out there and he wants to destroy you. You think that you can do all this stuff that we've been talking about through Ephesians all by your lonesome? You think you stand a chance? Really? You really think that you can do this with the devil out there trying to knock you down? Because the second that you think you got this figured out, he's going to just take you out at the knees and he's going to show you who's the boss. If you think that you're going to have any kind of chance and in the midst of any of this, you better start putting your faith in him. You better start putting on this whole armor of God and you better figure out who's trying to prevent you from doing it. Know your enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. When you have conflict with somebody on this planet, here's one of my favorite sayings. Amy, you probably could tell me exactly what I'm about to say. The problems that we face are not the problems that we face. You may be thinking to yourself, well, he's a dummy. Well, that might be true. The problems that we face are not the problems that we face. If you're having a conflict or something with somebody and you think it's because they hate you, that's not the problem that you face. There's something going on deeper than that that you got to get to the root of. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It might look like you're wrestling against flesh and blood. That might be what it seems like on the outset. But the problems that we face are not the problems that we face. There's something more going on. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Know your enemy. What do we wrestle against? Well, we, we wrestle against principalities and powers, against the ruler of darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Guys, these guys are everywhere. And they're powerful and they can infiltrate even heavenly places. And you might be saying to yourself, how do they get into heavenly places? Oh, well, have you read Job? Remember the first part of Job? Where was that little conversation between God and Satan and Job? Heavenly places. Oh. Yeah, guys, they can get about anywhere they want. That includes your house. That includes your place of work. That includes the roads. They can go anywhere they want to mess your life up. 
And they enjoy doing it. In fact, they get their kicks off of it. And if you're dumb enough to think that you can do this all by yourself to stand up against these demonic forces, you don't stand a chance. If you're going to be able to stand, and that's what he's trying to tell you to do, stand, so that you can stand, so that when you've done all everything, you can withstand and continue to stand. But if you don't follow through on this stuff, you don't stand a chance. You've got to know your enemy. And if you've got in conflict with somebody, it's not because of something they've said or done. It's because there's something else much more sinister at stake. I'd be willing to bet. Not that I'm a betting man, but that's my hunch. There's probably something more devious at stake. You should probably think about getting to the root of. Know your enemy. But we also find our strength in him by knowing our equipment. Starting in verse 14. Stand, therefore. If you're going to stand, this is how it's going to happen. It's not because of some self-help book you read or because you found a really cool person to talk to. This is not how you stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Put it around your waist. My pants kind of feel like they're going to fall. I don't think I got my belt on right. I'm being completely serious. You ever put your belt on wrong and you're just over here like this the whole time? You just, I just look stupid, don't I? I don't even need help with that. It's my belt's not on right. Like seriously, I just feel like turning around and like redoing it. What happens when you don't have your belt on right? Your pants are gonna fall down. You're gonna look dumb like this all the time. Your, your shirt's going to be out the back, little duck. You know, like, I don't know about you, but I don't need any help looking stupid, okay? If my belt was on correctly, if it was on the right hook, and it was on well, my pants would stay up straight, my shirt would probably stay tucked in, and I wouldn't be up here fidgeting with it the whole time. Now, anyway, where was I in this? Well, that's right. Gird your waist with truth. Put it around you like a belt. Truth. Because the second that you've got truth figured out, and what is truth? Even Jesus says in John 17, sanctify them with your word. Thy word is truth. What is the truth? And what is a lie? Can you figure it out? There's a lot of people out there that just can't seem to figure this one out, guys. Thy word is truth. What does God say about a given topic, a given issue, a given policy? What does God say about it? What is truth? Gird yourself with truth. If you know what truth is and you've got it around you like a belt, you're probably not going to be fidgeting like a dummy with a belt on the wrong hoop. You can do this. This book is just as accessible to you as it is anybody else. This is why we study it. This is why we come here Sunday mornings. This is why we research it. This is why we study it. This is why we memorize it. This is why we preach it. This is why we listen to it. Thy word is truth, and you've got to know it. Because if not, you're going to be tossed about within this world by every wind of doctrine and the trickery of men. It feels like we read that at some point. Remember reading that? This was a few weeks ago. Chapter 4. James also talks about it. If you don't know what truth is, you're going to be batted about like, like the voyager of the seas on day 4 of a cruise. <laughs> Believe me, you don't want that. <laughs> Gird yourself with truth. Know the truth, learn the truth, figure it out. We can talk about it. We can get there. What's the next one in verse 14? Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's a good one. What is righteousness? Nobody talks about righteousness. Nobody talks about what righteousness is or 
why it's required or why it's important or what God thinks about righteousness. And why is this even one of the things here? Who cares about the breastplate of righteousness? See, when I say you've got to put on the whole armor of God, you might be tempted to say, ah, this one doesn't make any sense. You know what you're saying about the belt and the truth and stuff? That one makes sense. I can do that one. But I don't know, a breastplate of righteousness? I'm out. No, don't be out. I'm begging you, don't be out. What is righteousness? It's doing what is right, having a right standing. Do you want to have a right standing with God or do you want to have a wrong standing with God? I'll give you a hint. You want a right one. You don't want to stand wrongly with the Lord. Eek. There is coming for everybody a judgment. And I would recommend that you have a right standing with the Lord. And that only comes through righteousness or doing that which is right. Unfortunately, for every one of us, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've fallen short of his righteousness. And that's a problem. So how can we have, gain, or maintain a sense of righteousness? When you're found in Christ Jesus, God grants you his righteousness or his right standing when you're found in him. Well, that's cool. And how does that work? You ever at work, here's a fairway story for you, Eleanor. Sometimes you're at work and let's say that you're a part-time employee and you're trying to tell, I don't know, anybody else, hey, you need to go fill the milk. And they look at you and go, <clears throat> I'm not doing that. You're a peon. I'm not gonna, that's not gonna happen. What happens if the same person says, Pat, the manager, wants you to go fill the milk? I bet they go into the cooler real quick. Get that milk filled up. What's the difference? Your message, the second message, is found in someone else and therefore carries the appropriate weight. When you're found in Christ, you now have his righteousness, his authority, his backing. And so when God looks at him, he's looking at you. It's one and the same now, because you're found in him. And you can have that righteousness in your life. And so when the devil comes alongside of you and says, hey, dummy, do you remember last week when you said that really stupid thing? You can put out your breastplate of righteousness and it'll go pink. I'm found in Christ, big guy. My case is dismissed on lack of evidence. Hit the road, Jack. Because I'm found in Christ and I have his righteousness in my life. Maybe I did mess up last week. Maybe I did. It's not hard for me to do. But I can ask for forgiveness. And Jesus, as my advocate, will get my case dismissed. Ping, ping, ping. My breastplate of righteousness. Isn't that cool? You got one of those? You want one? You need to be found in Christ. Because if you think you're going to try to do some of this stuff and submit to one another and, and love like Jesus and this sort of thing, I'll tell you what, if you don't have the truth on, it's going to be rough. If you don't have the breastplate of righteousness on, it's, it's going to be rough. What's the next one? Having your feet having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Gosh, you know how many people there are out there who don't even know what the word peace means? They are so full of chaos, corruption, confusion, and nonsense. You just don't understand how, where do they ever find tranquility in their life? 
When you shod your feet, when you put on, the word shod means to put on, when you put on your feet, the preparation of the gospel of peace, no matter where you go, no matter who you talk to, no matter when it is or where it is, you're seeking peace with all people. That will change your life. I'll tell you how this practically works out. There have been times in my life, and I know this is going to be hard to believe, well, maybe not for Amy so much, but for many of you, it may be hard to believe that I've yelled at people in the past. It's not confession time by any means, but they'll do something at work, and I'll say, you big dummy, why are you doing it like that? Hey, it happens. We lose our temper sometimes, you're right. Okay, so then... Ten minutes later, they'll say something about church. You know how inclined I am at that point to want to share Jesus with them? I feel like a big goose egg. My feet weren't shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I was busy sowing chaos, being angry, yelling, losing my temper, etc., I don't know, whatever you want to call it. How am I supposed to share Jesus with people that I'm angry with all the time? How am I supposed to share Jesus with people that I just yelled at? Right or wrong, good or bad, maybe they deserved it, maybe they didn't. How am I supposed to share my church with people that I just said something bad to? Are your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Maybe I'll put it to you this way. Who's the last person you shared Jesus with? And I don't just mean mentioning the name Jesus. Brother, I want to know who's the last person you shared the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who, who's the last person? Anybody? My husband. There you go. Get him, Pam. But you got to have the gospel of peace, son. Right? It's, it's tough if you don't. You got to be sharing Jesus. This is the point of the whole thing. You got to be sharing Jesus with people. You got to look for those windows and those opportunities. And as you're waiting for God to open up those doors, you got to be at peace with people. Maybe they said something really stupid to you and you just wanted to get them back because they deserved it. No. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because you don't know if that's the next person that God's going to open up a window to. But if you showed them kindness and gentleness and grace, maybe you showed them some mercy, and then the opportunity comes up, they're going to know that you could have got them. Most people aren't dumb like that. And then you get them with the gospel. You share Jesus with them. You share goodness, kindness. Romans chapter 2 tells us it's the goodness of God that can lead people to repentance. Do that for people. And then share Jesus with them. Share church with them. Share, share your testimony with them. Tell them how you came to know Jesus as your Savior. And above all, taking the shield of faith. You got a shield of faith? with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Because he's shooting them at you. He may be shooting them at you right now. I mean, just because I can't see these darts coming in. I mean, I tell you what, if you could see the spiritual side of warfare, I think every single last one of us would be completely surprised at what's going on in the spiritual world. I don't even know if we could handle it on this side of glory. The spiritual battles, the spiritual warfare that's going on right now, maybe even as we speak, would send all of us into a coma. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Maybe that's for the best. But what I do know is that anytime anybody ever gets a little glimpse of it, they all shriek away in fear. How much I do know. So how are you going to fight those fiery darts that are coming your way? And by the way, know your enemy well enough to know that those darts could just as easily come for you as anybody else. Shield of faith. 
The devil might be saying something like, you remember last week? Well, the last time you did that. And what are you going to do? You're going to go, yeah, Satan, you're right. I'm never going to do that again. And you go, whoop, whoop, whoop. Is that how you're going to handle this? Put your shield of faith up. Stand up against what's going on in this world. Stand up. Put your armor on. Put the whole armor of God on. Get your shield of faith up there and say, you know what? My Heavenly Father loves me. My God is for me and not against me. And there's nothing that I can do that will ever separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. He demonstrated his love to me and that while I was still a sinner, he died for me. And I can love you because he loved me first. Put your shield up, guys. And be ready to go for a battle because it's coming for you whether you know it or like it or not. So be ready to go. Put that shield up. And those darts will hit that shield and not hit you. So that you can keep moving forward and withstand everything that's being thrown at you. Because you're standing for the Lord and you're finding your strength in Him. So without any of this stuff, you don't stand a chance. You think you're going to do all this on your own? Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. What do you suppose that means? The helmet was one of the most important pieces of equipment for a soldier on the battlefield. Now why is that? Imagine I shoot you in the leg. You going to live? No, well, probably. Even if I shot you in the knee, that would probably hurt like crazy, but you'd probably live. What if I shot you in the arm? You'd probably live. What if I shot you in the stomach? It'd probably hurt too, but probably would live. What if I shot you in the head? Now you're probably dead. What piece of equipment do you need? Sometimes soldiers, all they would take is a helmet. You got to protect your head. Hayden went ice skating on the cruise ship. What piece of equipment did he have? A helmet. That's all that made him wear. Helmet, guys. Helmet. Got to protect your head. So what is it that God wants you to use as it relates to a helmet for this armor? Helmet of salvation. Now, what does that mean? Now, I'm going to tell you what I think it means. And if at any point, you know, you can text me this week and tell me if you think differently. But this is what I think the helmet of salvation is. Because there's really nothing else in here. So I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think the helmet of salvation is your testimony. When did you get saved? When did you come to know the Lord as your Savior? That's your salvation, isn't it? Yes. This means yes and this means no. That's your salvation. When you came to know the Lord is when you got saved. So tell me about that. If you're ever doubting, let's say one of those arrows gets past your shield of faith and it gets you in the head. And he's starting to make you doubt whether you know God or not. Or is this all for nothing? He got you in the head. Okay. What do you need to know? How do you withstand? What kind of armor should you have on? What kind of armor could you have on to combat that? When you're doubting, when you're wondering, if you can say, you know what, Satan? Yeah, you're making me struggle and doubt and wonder and confused. But you know what? On March 3rd, 2002... My God came into my life and he saved me. Boom. Let's go. Sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, that's the only offensive weapon listed here. I mean, I don't even know how many pieces we've got so far, but this is there's one offensive weapon. Just one. And it's a little two-sided sword. Man, I wish, you know, Paul, come on, buddy. I wanted a big old bruiser of a sword. 
Man, I wanted a sword so big it would impress anybody that sees it, like Goliath's sword. Man, why can't the offensive weapon in this thing be one of these swords that you got to be real good to pick up and carry and swing around? Man, I want an impressive weapon here. Man, I want something cool. And what kind of sword is it that we were given? It's this little sword. It's like, like a toy. It wasn't really a toy. It was a short sword, but its purpose wasn't to be flashy or big. Its purpose wasn't to be impressive or to land a fatal blow or anything like that. You know, this little sword is meant for even the most inexperienced of soldiers. It's meant to be agile. I mean, when you got all this armor on and you pick up this big old sword, remember what happened with David when he was going against Goliath and he puts on all this huge armor and he picks up this 80-pound spear? What happened? He was not very effective. He had to take it off. So God recognizes you're going to put on all this armor. The one weapon that you need is just a little sword that's very agile that you can just slice and dice and you can do real easily and quickly and very effectively. It might not be a giant broadsword, but you know what? It may be even more effective. It's two-sided so that you can go any which way you want, which gives it its agility, which also coincides with Hebrews chapter 4, which says that the Word of God is like a two-sided sword. So how good are you at using this thing? It all kind of weaves together. That's your equipment. Now we need to find our strength in him by knowing our effort. And he says this, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that my utterance, that may utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You got to know your effort. How much effort is Paul putting into his ministry? Answer, very little. How do I know that? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. He doesn't say, get out there and make sure that you know how to use the sword or make sure that you sharpen it or anything like that. He says, you need to be praying. Put it on, stand, and now you pray. Being watchful. Persevere. Supplication is another word for prayer. Pray, 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 pray. You're going to leave it all with God. Whenever these sorts of things start to happen and you're trying to do something, you leave it with God. You do, you do what you can do, but then you just leave it all with God. And you just pray, pray, pray. And pray for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly for the sake of the gospel. He doesn't say, pray for me that I may be able to go serve at some place or do something like that. He says, I need to be sharing the gospel with people. I need to be ready for this. This is why I'm in chains. This is why I get thrown into prisons. I need to be speaking the gospel. And this is my job to do it. And then he ends verses 21 through 24. That you may also know my affairs and how I'm doing. Tychicus, my beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs, that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you, uh, I'm sorry, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And that is the book of Ephesians. If you've got anything you want to do next week, let me know. Let's pray.